A few months ago, a group of leaders here at Orange Cove went down to Palm Coast, one of our sister churches, on a fact-finding visit. And uh, there's Pastor Bob Hayes busy explaining to us some of the key strategies that he uses in order to transform his church into a missional church. We were very excited to be there. We had lunch, and um, we spent the afternoon there. And around about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, we finished up the meeting, and we all drove back home in our vehicles. And I was driving alone. And so as I got onto Interstate 95, I saw ahead in the distance a young man walking with a backpack on his back. He was kind of stooped over. I could tell by his body language that he was not happy. And looking ahead of me, there was a huge, dark, black storm ready to break. I think within 10 or 15 minutes, that storm would have broken, and that young man would have been absolutely drenched. It was in the fall, so the, uh, the, wind, the, the wind was cooler, and I had, a, I had a decision to make. Should I or shouldn't I? And you know, in the good old days, you could stop without a question of a doubt, but today you've got to think twice. And so I said, Lord, should I or shouldn't I? And so racing through my mind was all the scenarios. And as I drove past him, I looked, and I could see he was clean cut. He didn't seem to have any bad auras around him, and so I stopped the vehicle. And I had gone quite a distance past him with all my deliberations, and I put it into reverse, and I, I backed up, and he got into the side of the van. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And so we took off and started a conversation. I said to him, what are you doing on the side of I-95 with a storm ready to brew? And he said to me, he had lost his job. There was a misunderstanding at work. He had lost his job. And a few weeks later, he had lost his apartment as well. To compound that situation, somebody had asked for a ride on his motorcycle and they got a little bit carried away with the speed and they wrecked the motorcycle into a post box and completely rode it off. So he was without a house, without a car, without transportation, without a job. And he was heading up to family where he thought he could make a new start. Well, I was only going as far as Jacksonville. He was going to North East Georgia. So now I thought to myself as I was driving, I think to myself now, I can drop him, you know, at the Orange Park exit and he's going to almost be in the same situation he was back in Palm Coast, right? Because he's going to have to try and find a ride. What do I do? So I felt impressed that I would take him to the Greyhound bus station and we would find the closest city to where his family was and I would buy him a bus ticket to get all the way home. And so here we're sitting at the bus station in Jacksonville and there's my, my friend. We are now friends on Facebook. Um, just a... Uh, a fine young man, and he'll probably smile if you ever heard I was using him as an illustration in a, um, in a sermon in front of my church. But, wow, what a great experience. And so I said to him, please call me as soon as you arrive home, uh, as, you, as soon as you get to your family. And I said, friend me on Facebook, and I'll share this, pic this picture with you, and uh, this is a selfie. I've got a real long arm, so I can take it. You couldn't see that it was a selfie. So, um, so there he is, all the way to be safe and sound with his family. 
and he called me the next day, and guess what? I felt great. I felt so excited that I was able to save a young man from being drenched on the I-95, and I could get him all the way th- back to his family um, in this terrible situation that he was facing. Doesn't it feel good to make a difference in a person's life? Doesn't it feel good to step out and help somebody that's really in dire need? It's called a helper's high. When we help someone and we reach out to someone who's in a dire need, we get a rush, a surge of I don't know if it's adrenaline or endorphins or what it is, but it feels great to do it. And uh, I know the, the brother that came with me um, last week when we bailed one of our brothers out of jail, it felt great. When he called and he said, I'm home, it felt great. We were made to serve. We were made to minister. And so number 2A in your notes We ask ourselves the question, what would the culture in a perfect world be like? When we go out of our way to help somebody in need or facing someone in crisis, it really brings a good feeling to us, not so. It's called the helper's high. If we in a fallen world experience the helper's high, what do you think the culture of giving, serving, and helping was like? Your first word, underlined in blue, unfallen world. What do you think it was like? Imagine the culture in an unfallen world. Nobody is left out. Everybody is served. So let's think about that for a minute. The thrill of being other-centered, your next word, The thrill of being other-centered must have been beyond comprehension. No one was left out, your next word. Think about it for a second. Because when everyone served everyone else, thus everyone was served. There was no need to consider self, your next word. When everyone was being served by one or more persons, self could not have existed in an in a unfallen world. There was no consideration of self. I don't have to have this fear. I know I grew up in a family of five. And there was always a fear that you wouldn't have enough. Because you've got these little, you know, these little gremlins all around the table, you know, grabbing, 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 dividing up, all trying to get their, their fill for the day. So you've always got this fear that you're not going to get enough. And sometimes that carries on into your adult life. And you always, you know, will I get enough? Who's taking the biggest piece? None of that was in an unfallen world. Because everyone was served by everyone else. And I found this cute little graphic um, on uh, on iStock, on one of the iStock libraries. (laughs) This hand's helping this hand. This helps hands helping that hand, that help hands helping that hand, that help hands helping this hand, and this hand is helping this one again. So every hand's being helped, right? So we don't have to worry whether we're going to be helped or not. Because in an unfallen world, everyone's serving everyone else. It's a great thing. And so how beautiful would it be if we in the church could have the same thing? Everybody's being served by everyone else all the time. So I don't have to worry. And I think when we read Acts chapter 2, we see that culture there. Everyone was serving everyone else. And so I didn't worry when the apostle called me to sell my possessions and bring the money into the, the main kitty at the church. I did it because I knew I was going to be served. I wouldn't go hungry. That kitty's there to serve me. As well, and I have no more fear. There's no more obsession to protect and provide for self. 
You get what I'm saying? It's great, isn't it? So we see here in Hebrews 1 verse 14 that the angels are all what? Ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation. Wow, that's all the angels do. They live, your next word, they live to minister, to give, to support, to help, to encourage, to guide, to build up, to comfort, to protect, deliver, shelter, rescue, instruct, convey messages. They live to serve. And that is the culture that existed before the fall. And you know, that culture is like so strange to us. Number C, number 2C, that culture, it's almost impossible for us to comprehend what a selfless world would be like. We might have reached the point in our lives where we realize that other, an other-centered life gives us more fulfillment, but as a fallen human being, self is always our first consideration. We might even serve others so that we can experience that help is high. That's your next word is experience. And I don't know, I'm just asking the question, could it be that we help others so that we can experience the helpers high, but it's actually a selfish motive? <laughs> you know what I mean? How many of us have been hurt by selfishness or greed? It's a horrible thing. But my friends, because we were born in this world and we've grown up with self being kind of the the heartbeat of our culture and our society, we've become accustomed to it. So our, our senses, our discernment is not as sharp about the, the difference between selfishness and selflessness. We experience nice little acts of kindness here, of, here and there like I did with this young man, and we applaud it. But are we tuned in to selfishness and how grotesque and horrible it really is? Or are we accustomed to live with self as the motivating factor from others and from ourselves? When I was still in South Africa, um, as you know, I owned and managed a fitness center there for 14 years. And uh, three or four years into my, into my time in the, in the fitness industry, I had the opportunity to buy out my competition. I might have told you the story before. But here I am, I just, I just signed the deal with the owners, bought this additional uh, fitness center that I was going to take the one that I was in, I was going to move in there. It's a bigger place. It had more uh, facilities, and I was expanding. And so I came into the new fitness center all excited, and I said, hi, everybody. Um, and and the, they were, these were the old m members that were there, and I said, uh, hi, my name is Andre. Um, I'm the new owner. And so one of the guys came up to me and says, wow, congratulations. Uh, uh, tell me, um, what did you pay for this fitness center? I said, oh, man, I got it for a real good deal. And I was a little wet behind the ears. I wasn't a seasoned businessman, you know, wear everything on my sleeve, whatever you see is what you get kind of thing. And I said, no, I paid $27,000 for it. He says, oh, man, that's a really good price. You know what he did? He found out who the previous owners were. He called them up and he offered them $35,000 for that same business because it was a good deal. And so the owners knew the landlords, and the owners called the landlords and say, don't give that guy a, a lease, the, the guy who bought, the first guy who bought the business. He's a risk. So the landlords wouldn't give me a lease because they were hoping that I would then back off and not buy the business. Thank God, <laughs> some months before, I was introduced into one of the best attorneys 
in our city. And the attorney called the, the landlords up and said, listen, if you don't give that guy a lease, we will go trade on the street, but we are buying that business and we will take action. And cut a long story short, the owners backed away and honored the agreement that I had signed with them. But how cutthroat is that? I mean, you know, to my face. And the next day after he made that phone call, um, he, he treated me like nothing existed, you know. Selfish, greedy, conniving, backstabbing. But that's how life is. That's how we've grown up. We understand and we accept it. When it happens to us, we take it like it's second nature. So our scripture for today, number 2D, is found in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. You remember last week, we looked primarily at Philippians chapter 3. And I wish we had time to go through the whole chapter. But now we're looking at Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. And it clearly calls believers to revert to the culture that was present before the fall. Your next word, fall. A culture of service, sacrifice, and selflessness. Selflessness. So let's look at that little piece. We're going to go to a little more detail, but let's look at this quickly. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. My friends, you could read this chapter every day, over and over and over again, till it soaks in and reveals the culture that God is calling us to, to live in as believers here today, right now. It says, therefore... If there's any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of His Spirit, what does it say then? Any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Remember last week we spoke about what that looks like. Let nothing be done. And now Paul starts and he's now in just a, a paragraph, he's trying to describe to us what this culture looked like before, what the culture was before the fall. He says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or, or, or vain conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you not look out, not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Does that sound like the culture that existed before the fall? Of course it does. Of course it does. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. My friends, this call goes out. It goes out to, to believers in Christ. We need to, we need to be like the screening agents that stand at the courthouse or at the airport, you know, with their with their wands, or, or, or having that little, little gateway where you walk through and you stand there with your hands up, you know, and you get the, the screen, the screening device that goes up and around you. We need to have one of those. We need to screen for selfishness. We need to screen for greed and pride and puffing ourselves up and making ourselves up higher than others. We need to screen for that. We need to ask God to sensitize us to anything of self so that indeed we can have the mind of Christ. And we can turn our backs on the culture that came into this world and we can embrace the culture that was in this world before sin came in. And so number 2C, we see that we see that Jesus Christ had a mind which was in harmony with the culture before the fall. And Paul calls all believers in Christ to have 
the same mind. The mind which was also in Christ Jesus. As we said in the last session, having the same mind doesn't mean all agreeing about everything. What does it mean? It means all being selfless. Your next word is selfless. All having the same priorities. In other words, understanding what is true loss and what is true gain. Remember this, what we spoke about last week. And all being washed and cleansed by the blood of Christ. That's what it means to have the same mind. We can have the same mind by rejecting selfishness. We can have the same mind by embracing a culture of service, selflessness, and sacrifice. We can have that same mind. No, we don't all have to agree that the carpet should be blue. No, we don't all have to agree that we have to eat broccoli and spinach three times a day. But we can all agree to live a selfless life of servitude. So here's the question for you now. Where did the mind of Christ come from? We've established that Paul is calling us to live in the selfless culture that happened before the fall. And we know that Christ lived in that culture. But where did Christ's perfect, selfless mind of sacrifice and servitude, where did that come from after he came to this earth? Number 3a, invariably we assume that Christ came down from this perfect heavenly culture and that a perfect selfless mind came down with him, right? The Word, who was with God and who was God, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We know that. John 1 verse 1 and John 1 verse 16. We assume that Christ's perfection and holiness was transformed, sorry, transferred into a human form and then dwelt amongst us. And that's a life that we could never imitate. Your next word, imitate. So where did Christ get his perfect mind? This mind that we want. We want to have the mind of Christ. But how did Christ have a perfect mind? Did his perfect mind stay with him when he took on human flesh? Your next word, human flesh. Or did Christ put his perfect holy mind aside and access a perfect holy mind the same way we access a perfect and holy mind? Let's quickly look at what the Bible says. Sorry, your next word. So, Your next word is human flesh. Did you get it? I didn't have it on the screen, but I did mention it. Christ took on the same mind as we had after the fall. Look what the Bible says. Philippians 2 verse 7, it says, But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming how? In the likeness of men. And that word in Greek, likeness, homo, homo, yoma. Excuse me, I'm not Greek, I'm English. Homo yoma. It means such as amounts to equal or identity of a representation, an image. So Christ came in the likeness of men. He didn't have a divine mind but a, a human body. He had a human mind and a human body. Hebrews 2 verse 14 and 17. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, but just inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, and who's the children? Us, right? He himself likewise shared in what? The same. Same body, same fallen nature, same mind. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Verse 17. Therefore, in how many things? Some things? A few things, 
No, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. Body, mind, and soul. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of people. Now let me tell you something. If Jesus transferred his unfallen mind down and lived amongst us, how could he be my example? That, does not, he, that doesn't inspire me to follow him because I have a fallen mind, I have a fallen body. But if I know that Jesus had a, fallen, a, a, a perfect mind, even though he had a fallen mind, I want to find out how that took place. You get me? If he was that kind of an example to me, that he took on the same as what I have. He took on the same, but he had the perfect mind. And the Bible says, have this mind in you, what was also in Christ Jesus. I'm going, yes, sir. Yes, sir. How did that happen? That's very inspirational to me. And so, um, oh, sorry, I haven't even read this one yet. Hebrews 4 verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was how? In all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. I want to follow the Son of Man, don't you? He's the Son of God, but He came down to be the Son of Man and walk the same dusty roads with the same fallen nature as you and I, yet without sin. Now that inspires me. That inspires me. Number three, C. These scriptures clearly state that Jesus laid down his perfect mind aside and took on all of our fallen nature. Your next word. And this is a magnificent mystery. Jesus gained his perfect sinless mind in the same manner as we can gain our perfect sinless mind. What do I hear? Isn't that beautiful? So my friends, when Paul says, have this mind in you, he's not giving you some unrealistic, impossible goal to reach. He's saying, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who came down in the likeness of men, with the mind of men, the fallen nature of men, the body of men, and surrendered to his Father in such a way that he was filled with the Spirit, moment by moment and day by day, to where his mind was transformed to have the mind of God. That is what we are called to. That's what it means to have the mind of Christ. And so we come to the next question in number four. What were the traits of Christ's character? What were the traits of his mind? And now we go back to Philippians chapter two, and we move on from verse five to verse six. And let's look. What was that mind like? What was this unfallen culture like? What was it like before sin came in? This thing that we've gotten so used to, where we're fighting for our rights and we're fighting to be treated fairly and we want to protect ourselves and we, what was it like? And I'm, I'm going through the Amplified Bible because the Amplified Bible does just that. It looks at the Greek word and it looks at the broader descriptions of what the passage is talking about. So it's saying Christ, who although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, in brackets here, possessing the, full, possessing the fullness of the attributes which made God God, did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained. You get that? So here's Jesus Christ. He is God. He's one with the Father. He's the creator. But he doesn't strive as the son of man to be God again. He lays 
his godly mind, his godly body, his godly attributes. He lays it aside, and this is a magnificent mystery. We will never understand that until we get to eternity, and we'll probably study it throughout eternity. But he lays this aside, and he refuses to take it up again. The Bible says he was in all points tempted as we are, but guess what? He was tempted in more points than we are. Because when he had his hands tied behind his back, when he was whipped with those 40 lashes minus one, he did not lay hold of his godly qualities. He could have blinked an eye and he could have vaporized all those vile criminals who were abusing him. But he did not. He did not consider Equality with God, something to be grasped. He laid it aside and he refused to take it up again in spite of being spat on and beaten. I'm going to come back to this other side. I'm going to quickly just go through. Verse 7, but stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity. And the Bible in the, in the New King James says, of no reputation. Of no reputation. He came into this world in the midst of a scandal. In a legalistic culture where his mother was assumed to have birthed him unwed. In the midst of a scandal. But he came of no reputation, being willing to be scorned and abased. He became like a man and was be born a human being. A magnificent mystery, my friends, that we will not understand. But the end product is so inspiring that we, will, we should be able to give our lives for that. And after he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even death on the cross. How many of us are willing to stoop and be humbled? Jesus Christ demonstrated that humility by washing the, the mucky, muddy feet of his disciples. Stooping low, stooping low. I don't know about you, but I hate crawling on the ground under my car or under a sink. You know, I, I, uh, I just hate that. My father's a, a guy who loves to fix things, and whenever we work on the car, he's the one that goes under the car, and I'm kind of, you know, I'll get a piece of cardboard and slide it on the ground, and then I'll kind of go under there gingerly. But he just dives on the ground and just shoo, goes right under there and starts looking. Going down on the ground and stooping low doesn't come natural to us. But the Son of Man made himself nothing. He gave himself for the world, not considering his own state. But we have a very different culture on the opposite side of this table. It's the culture that Lucifer introduced into our universe. You see, the mind of Lucifer is juxtaposed to the mind of Christ. It's a polar opposite. Like light is to darkness, like fire is to ice, is the mind of Lucifer compared to the mind of Christ. If you go to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to 14, you'll see the mind of Lucifer. It says, How you have fallen from heaven, O light bringer and day star. That's what he was. Son of the morning. How you have been cut down to the ground, you who weakened and laid low the nations. See, that's what Satan's motivation is. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. Weakening the nations, infusing sickness and disease, bringing on calamities and, and disasters on the earth. Laying low the nations and exalting himself. Christ did the opposite. 
Christ laid himself known low and he lifted up the nations. Carry on on this side under Lucifer and he says, And you said in your heart, I will, descend, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne, my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the assembly in the utmost north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And you contrast that to someone who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Here you have someone who wants to make himself like the most high. My friends, can you see how these cultures are at, in, in direct conflict with one another? Opposite. And so we ask ourselves the questions, how do we relate in this culture? Notice the contrast between the two minds. Christ's mind is humble. Satan's mind is proud. Christ is selfless. He is selfish. Christ stoops low. Oh, but he must be exalted. Christ gives us freedom of choice. Lucifer controls. Have you ever seen someone trying to get out of an addiction? Oh, no. He wants them there, and he wants to keep them there. Christ brings peace. He brings strife. Christ brings reconciliation. He brings division. Christ will not condemn. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Christ is the provider. Satan is the thief and the robber. Christ brings comfort. Satan inflicts suffering. Christ is serving. Satan is demanding. He wants to be served. Jesus took our fallen natures, which included our fallen minds, and demonstrated the mind and character of his father. His life fully exposed the truth about sin and evil. And that is when persecution comes upon us. When our lives expose selfishness, greed, that's when we become persecuted. Because we are coming up against the culture which Satan brought into this world. So let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. God calls for our minds to be transformed. Where? Back. Back to where they were before the fall. The fact that Paul said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus shows that Christ's perfect mind didn't transform down, transfer down from heaven. The magnificent mystery is that he also, like us, had to have his mind transformed by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So how did he do that? My friends, I believe this is the good fight of faith right here. There's a few simple steps that we need to understand on what it takes to have the mind of Christ. Because Christ had the mind of his Father. Christ was the Son of Man. He did not have a, a holy, perfect mind transformed, transferred down to him. He did not have his heavenly mind transferred to his earthly body. Like us, he had to have his mind transformed by the indwelling of the Spirit by the following. Realizing how helpless he was in his own strength. John 5, 19 is one of my favorite scriptures. You know what it says? The Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. Jesus realized the Son of Man is helpless. The Son of Man has laid aside the Son of God's qualities and attributes and power. He came as the Son of Man, a helpless baby, a helpless child, a helpless teenager, a helpless young man, a helpless adult. 
He did this by understanding his fallen nature and its tendency to sin. Something I myself don't realize. We're so used to having a sinful nature. We're so used to acting by default and thinking that's the way that things should be done. We're so used to it that we do it. But it's time for us to come face to face with our sinful natures and realize that if we allow it, it will drag us down and into eternal ruin. And so like the publican came and fell down at the front of the church, not even wanting to look up, beating his chest and say, be merciful to me, oh God, a sinner. We've got to realize who we are and what the sinful nature is. It's a horrible thing. It's like a spiritual AIDS that has no immunity It will drag the person down into eternal ruin. Romans 8 tells us that Christ condemned sin in his flesh. My friends, we need to condemn sin in our flesh. We need to have a repulsion against it. We need to know that we are, we are infected by this, this horrible, debilitating virus. And we cannot get used to living with it. It needs to be a daily rejection, a daily repulsion, a daily refusal to have anything to do with it. Jesus did this by praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit daily. We read that when Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water praying. And what happened? The Holy Spirit came down upon him in the form of a dove and he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us, filled with the Spirit, he went and did his ministry. But he did this by submitting to his Father's will, moment by moment. What did Jesus keep saying? Not my will, but thy will be done. It's the Father's will that he lived by. He did this by spending both quality and quantity time with his Father. Sometimes whole nights in prayer. How many of us get five minutes to read the little short devotional in the morning paper for our time with God? And we wonder why the sinful nature has full control in our lives. I know when you've been through a crisis, like our brother and our sister here, there's something that, that, that clicks in our minds where we can't sleep late in a slothful slumber, giving no thought to our sinful nature and the power of God to subdue it. When we're in crisis, we're up. We've got energy that we don't know we had, seeking the word of God, hungering and thirsting for him, coming before him, confessing our sin and saying, oh God, I need you today more than I've ever needed you before. Fill me with your presence. I cannot walk, I cannot think, I cannot talk unless you fill me, God. He did this by not living only by physical bread, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In the temptations, every time Satan came to him, he said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. My friends, we eat three times a day. In the Western world, we enjoy lavish fare. But how often do we eat and chew and ingest the word of God? Like our very lives depend upon it. Every word Realizing that this word has the same power to recreate as the same word of God had to create the universe. Do we realize that? Number five B. We cannot overcome sin, battle against evil, or grow to be spiritually mature while we are double-minded. Believing that it's normal to have a mix between the mind of Lucifer and the mind of Christ. 
We cannot serve two masters. We are called to reject anything that isn't in sync and in harmony with the mind of Christ. And so my friends, what are we praying for? Are we praying for that sensitivity to discern between the mind of Satan and the mind of Christ? In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, this is not in your notes, so please write it in. And I speak to myself here as a a third generation Adventist pastor. And I speak to you who've been in the church a long time. It says, in Hebrews 5 verse 12, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Listen to this. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. How many of us, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil? And evil? Or are our lives just a mush mash of good and evil combined in the same pot that we lavishly consume? Or do we know the culture before the fall and the culture after the fall? Do we follow the path that Christ followed so that we can understand? What it means to have the mind of Christ and to know the difference between his mind and the mind of Lucifer. So here comes the call today. Will you and I pray for God's spirit to reveal the magnificent mystery of having the mind of Christ. Of having this mind in us that was also in Christ Jesus. Will we pray for God's Spirit to reveal to us how helpless we are in our own strength? I'd like you to take these five things in your notes with you this week. And I want you to pray over them that these steps will be your steps. We'll pray to know how hopeless we are in our own strength. That we'll pray about our fallen natures and its tendency to sin. That we'll pray about the importance of condemning sin in our flesh and having a repulsion to it and a sensitivity to us that we can know the difference. That we will pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Pray how to submit to the Father's will every moment. Pray about the importance of spending time alone in God's presence. And pray about the importance of living by the Word of God. That His Word will be our Word. That his word will be our word. Who will pray for the Holy Spirit to form the mind of Christ in them today? Let me see your hands. That's so beautiful, my friends. What a beautiful subject. I want to pray for the mind of Christ. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Father in heaven, what a lofty, noble subject we have touched on today. Having the mind of Christ. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. This magnificent mystery that we will never understand on this planet, but we will research and ponder for eternity. How the Son of God laid aside all His divine qualities and became the Son of Man, just like me. But yet through an intimate, personal, closely connected relationship with his father, had that perfect, sinless mind. Oh God, I pray for that today. 
And I pray for every person here today, everyone watching online, the time has come for God's children to have the mind of Christ. Oh God, lead us this, into the steps, the practical disciplines, the understanding of how to discern between good and evil, how to discern between compromise and commitment, how to discern between allurement with the world and being one with God himself. Lord, I thank you that we could raise up our hands this morning and say, we are praying for the mind of Christ today. In Jesus' name, amen. At the Orange Cove Church, we 